I feel like I may have crashed the wrong party. Uh, I certainly am not the smartest person in this room. Um, normally I speak to either film students or Teamsters. I tell them where to park the truck so they won't be in the shot. When I looked at the syllabus for this conference, I realized I'm way out of my depth. I know nothing about the fa fabulous Perot sensing sources or deep turbulence MIRI 3. The one thing I do know is that probably everybody in this room has had some input into making the devices that I use to be a cinematographer better. The question that I'm actually asked the most is, what is a cinematographer? No, I am not the guy behind the camera. That's the camera operator. Um, so what is cinematography? Well, you know, it's 2017, so I consulted the Oracle Wikipedia, and just bear with me because it's a little dry, but let me read to you what Wikipedia says cinematography is. Cinematography is the science or art of motion picture photography by recording light or other electromagnetic radiation, either electronically by means of an image sensor, which is the more current way, or chemically by means of a light sensitive material such as film stock. Typically, a lens is used to repeatedly focus the light reflected from the objects into real images on the light sensitive surface inside a camera during a questioned exposure, creating multiple images. With an electronic image sensor, this produces an electrical charge at each pixel, which is electronically processed and stored in a video file for subsequent display or processing. The result with photographic emulsion is a series of visible latent images on film stock, which are later chemically developed into a visible image. The images on the film stock are played back at rapid speed and projected onto a screen, creating the illusion of motion. That was the only way to do cinematography when I started. And there was always this great thrill when you saw that lainted image developed and you knew that you still had a job the next day. This is to me what cinematography is, sorry. Okay, so that's a little example of what I do. And my mindset is always the same, which is whether it's the founder, Jurassic World, or the upcoming Star Wars, what's the best photographic way to tell the story? I have a camera, I have lenses, but my technique changes from film to film, as you can see, because they're all vastly different. And these days, sort of, the, the filmmaking process is broken into three sort of separate pieces. There's the prep period, there's the production period, and there's the post-production period. Prep is the planning phase. It's where we scout possible locations, we design sets, we do a lot of photographic tests of costumes, especially now in the digital age, because moray has become a huge problem. Moray was something that never existed in film because the silver halide crystals were in a different spot on every frame of film. Now I've got addressable pixels on a sensor, and I've got those same pixels on a projector, and it's created a real problem. Uh, Mr. Goodman, Dr. Goodman's jacket would be a no-go in a movie. We couldn't use it. It would literally buzz, right? Now, as image sensors are getting better and bigger, that problem becomes l less of an issue, but it's, it's something that we never, I never had to deal with before 2007, and now it's really, become a problem, this pattern on the floor. And the only way to know is to literally put every single lens up and test everything that you're gonna put in front of that camera. So it's created a little bit of a headache for us. 
Um, you know, our days are planned for efficiency. You know, a major motion picture crew is literally like FEMA. We are 40, 53-foot semi-trucks. We come with latrines. We come with water. We come with food. We sometimes will lay six, seven miles of cable. We do lighting. And we m maybe move our base camp every day. I mean, we are literally like having somebody come to a disaster. In this case, usually it's a disaster after we leave. Um, but you have to be prepared. A movie like Jurassic World costs $100,000 an hour. So, you know, it's a lot of responsibility. You know, there's, you just, you have to be ready to go. And I'm just going to show you, like, during prep on, on for the, I don't have the final sequence, but I'll show you how we plan a sequence, which was the end sequence of Jurassic World. I think you'll find it interesting because probably everybody in this room had had something to do with some aspect of what you're going to see. And... By the way, I don't think anybody's ever seen this, so consider, your, consider yourself lucky or I'm going to be in trouble. So this is what we call a tech viz, and this is basically what you're going to see is an animation of the end of the movie. The difference is that the sets have been designed, they are being modeled at ILM in Maya, uh, and everything is predicated on the fact that when we go out and photograph the elements, in most cases these are just the foreground elements because the dinosaurs obviously don't exist, and some of the backgrounds don't exist. They're just giant green panels, which make it easy to separate the foreground from the background. But let me just run you through this, and if anybody has a question, you know, you can just scream it out. I, I have no agenda. I'm just here to kind of entertain you guys and give you a little bit of insight into what we do. It, it is very hard work. We probably work about a 75-hour week most weeks when we're filming. So if you look in the upper right, that's actually what the camera is going to see. And if you look uh, at the upper left, that's a plan view. And it'll show you where the camera position is. And we will literally go around the set and, and take exact measurements with uh, our disto. The ILM has LIDAR'd the entire set. So although there's a little room for flexibility, obviously when we composed this animation, we may not have known that Chris Pratt was six foot four, so the camera height may change, but all of the lensing is accurate, the distances are accurate. It's something that I and the director work out with some computer animators, and then we basically transfer it to a plan that not only we can execute, but ILM can follow, and, and uh, you know, a sequence like this took nine months to complete in post-production. I mean, so hopefully that gives you some insight into the fact that we don't just sort of go out there and on these sequences and wing it. It's just too expensive. I want to say that there was a shot that took 11 days to render with 1,000 processors. So these, these are huge amounts of data. I mean, I'm speaking to a room that understands this better than I do. I just know that uh, we create a lot of data when we shoot digitally. Uh, we actually create a lot of data when we shoot on film. Ironically, Jurassic World was shot photochemically, and that partially was because the other ones had been done that way. But also ILM, the visual effects company, which is right over here in the Presidio, actually prefers to scan information off of a negative than a digital file because it just it has more dynamic range. We're getting to the place where digital sensors are as good as film, but you know, it depends on who you ask. And when it comes to a movie like this, if ILM is going to have to create dinosaurs and they want me to shoot it on film, I'm, I, there's no reason why I'm not going to. At the end of the day, my job is to make the best looking version of this script as I possibly can. Actually, a lot of this movie was shot in 65 millimeter film, which is four times the negative area of 35. It's a very large piece of film. Uh, the production phase is when we actually would go and do this, it's when you realize that all the problems that you knew about in prep were not addressed and then you have to solve them. We work in the real world. A lot of this movie was done in Hawaii. The weather, it may say sunny in the script, but the Hawaiian weather gods are not so kind. And usually it takes a day or two or three to shoot a two minute scene of people outside talking. So it can be really you know, quite challenging. Um, 
you just, those are the days when you realize that you don't have enough time and you don't have enough money and you don't have a lot of resources, you don't have enough resources, even though you're spending a million dollars a day, which sounds like an absurd amount of money. Uh, and certainly at times it, it feels like it. Uh, usually I, I'm surrounded by an incredible amount of equipment and the only hope is that I don't have to use it. The producer would come to me every day and say, do we need all these lights? And I would say to him, if I don't have to shoot when it rains, I can send them all home. He'd say, oh no, you better keep them. So the mandate was you had to make the days work. That, that really is what it came down to. So that's one of the reasons why movies are so expensive. Uh, Post-production is where it's really changed for somebody like me. In the days of photochemistry, I would sit in a lab with a color timer and I had a filter pack, cyan, yellow, and magenta. And we would literally, as we were looking at the film, hold colored gels up in front of our eyes to figure out what would be the right way to affect the color correction of the film. Uh, it was fantastic, I loved it, but it, every time you needed to make an adjustment, you had to take the negative, which was essentially on Jurassic World, $202 million of money has been converted into 12,000 feet of SDAR-based negative film. Every time you put that up on a machine that was built in the 1950s, the studios get a little bit nervous. So it was a bit rudimentary. I mean, we, we, gained, we had great results, but it was, a, it was not, as I started to realize that John and Tom Knoll were sitting next to me at USC Film School, and they had, were some of the original authors of Photoshop, I kept wondering, when is this kind of technology going to suddenly come into our world? And Hollywood is very slow to sort of change direction. You know, it's sort of like, it's a bit like an aircraft carrier. It can bring a lot of force to bear, but it just doesn't move very quickly in one direction or another. Um, you know, in the days of 35 millimeter film, everything was kind of standardized. And one of the beauties of 35 millimeter film was that the end product, the release print, was of almost equal resolution to the image, the, the original negative image. So if I shot a movie and then I, and I showed, I could, in certain theaters, I could show you a print off of the original negative. You were seeing basically the best resolution that you could possibly see. The unfortunate thing for me in, in digital cinema today is that the ability to capture an image has far exceeded our ability to exhibit it to an audience. And I know I'm sort of getting ahead of myself, but it's really, to me, it's the major difference. I'm certainly not looking to put the genie back in the bottle, and I'm just hoping that I'm looking at an audience that's going to help me get the ability to view these images in their native resolution to the public faster. I mean, I, let me just, I will, just as a for instance. Well, anyway, I, I've been using a Nikon D810 as a DSLR camera just for my own home use. I think it's an absolutely beautiful sensor. It's a, it's a Nikon camera. It's a Sony-based 36 megapixel sensor. The, I'm sure in your world there is a device that can play it in full resolution. I've got an expensive 5K Dell monitor at home. I'm only seeing 25% of that image. That wasn't the case when I would shoot with my Leica M6 on Kodachrome 64. I could project that slide at, at full resolution. And that, to me, is really the, the most difficult part of digital cinema that I'm dealing with. Um, it's, it's really, it's a drag, in all honesty. I mean, so, you know, the late 90s brought in the advent of film scanning. So now we could take the negative, we could scan it on a, on a high-resolution laser scanner, convert it into a digital file, a DPX file is what we use in the film business. I think we've now gone to what's called open, 16-bit open EXR, but inevitably it's just, it's some kind of raw data file that we use in the film industry that, uh, we, a lot of, we use a lot of color correcting on a machine called the DaVinci Resolve. I'm sure there are several other companies that build these color correction tools. And that gave me the ability to suddenly have all the tools that I had in Photoshop. You know, and, and by the way, just because you have those tools doesn't mean you should use them. I'm sure you've all seen movies in which they sort of look a little overly manipulated. I think the idea is always to still try to preserve your work, but to utilize those tools to you know, fix, fix certain problems in a way that we couldn't. The other thing was in, in the late 90s and early 2000s, we were still projecting on film. So what this really enabled me to do was take this digital file that I've now color corrected in a, with very sophisticated tools, 
scan it back out to negative, and not only negative, but I could make multiple negatives. So now everyone who was going to the theater was essentially seeing an original print, a, a first generation print off of what is now a new digital original negative. And this was sort of the late 90s and early 2000s. And I will tell you that it was the, it was the pinnacle for, for cinema for audiences. I don't know if you, how many of you can remember, but really, at the time that I did Seabiscuit, when you would go to the theater, you were seeing the best quality image you had ever seen. It just had not gotten, it never been better than that because you weren't having to make two dupes to get to the release print. You were literally making multiple negatives. They were all the same. They were lossless, they were digital, and you'd make a thousand prints off of a negative, you'd throw it away, you'd put the next new negative up, and you'd make everybody, whether you were in rural Kansas or at the North Point Cinema here in San Francisco, which is a great theater, you were seeing the same image. So f for somebody like me, it was really, it was the, it was the ultimate expression of, of our work. Um, you know, that was fantastic. And then, unfortunately, you know, we entered the world of, of digital projection. And from a cinematographer's point of view, the resolution of digital projectors just, they don't compare to film. I mean, basically, digital projection is an HD image. Um, the, Color space is a strange LUT. Um, the contrast ratio is half of that of a film projector. I mean, the only positive thing that I see in digital projection for, as a cinematographer is that the, the file is the same on day 30 as, as it is on day one. I certainly will tell you that you've been to the theater and no film print is the same on day six as it is on day one. Obviously, from a corporate point of view, it was a win-win. Uh, film cases. Uh, uh, a film weighs about 80 pounds, it comes in cans. You'd ship 8,000 of those on a Friday all over America. Now you either just ship hard drives or you license uh, the theaters to log onto a server and download the movie. So from a studio standpoint, this cut an incred you know, incredible amount of cost. Problem was for me, it also sort of denigrated my work. I got caught up in the analog versus digital debate. And that's certainly not one that I want to have with anybody in this room because I'm not trying to put the genie back in the bottle. It's just the economics of, of it all got ahead of the aesthetics. And I know that we all, I mean, I love my iPhone and I love having 8,000 songs on it. I'm sure there are a lot of people in this room who, like the doctor was saying, are audiophiles. It does, you know, there are, analog does sound better. I'm not, I'm not advocating it, but it, you know, and, 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 I, and because I am the steward of the image, I'm trying to fight for the best looking image. Obviously, I can't, I can't put, I can't turn the clock back. I can't put the genie back in the bottle, but I can certainly try to get everybody to raise their game. Um, the camera manufacturers certainly have. I just need to get the exhibitors to raise their game so that you guys can really see the kind of things that we're doing, which is you know stunning with the sensors, which are incredibly light sensitive. They can capture images in ways that we never could before. The color correction tools, the post-production tools, all that stuff is just, it's stunning. You're not seeing it. The movie theater projector is no better than your plasma, if you happen to have a plasma, if you have an LG OLED, that is a better way, that's a better version of whatever movie I'm doing than that you see in the theater. It's not the community experience, but from a visual standpoint, it, it is better. So when I think about making a movie, I, I really have two choices. I mean, I have, well, I have more than that. I have film versus digital, or that, that's usually dictated by the studio. So it's my choice as to whether we use spherical lenses, traditional flat lenses, which I'm sure that everybody, Rebecca here with her DSLR, we, I assume everybody in this room knows what a spherical lens is, uh, or anamorphic lenses. And anamorphic lenses were designed in the 50s to compete with what they thought was television. And essentially, anamorphic lenses took a spherical prime lens and put a curved front element over it and allowed you to create a widescreen image and squeeze it onto the entire sort of square aspect ratio of film. Um, the flat aspect ratio is 185, which was just a way of sort of cropping top and bottom, and you were basically throwing away 35 or 40 percent of the negative. But this was the most common way we've all seen films. Anamorphic or scope was designed to, to create 
a better looking image because it's using 40% more negative, and when you project it, you're blowing it up half as much. I mean, it's, it's why if you can remember seeing Apocalypse Now or The Last Emperor, you're seeing really, you're seeing the richness of, of you were seeing state of the art technology at the time. But there's a huge difference between the two. Uh, an anamorphic lens has double the magnification. So what is a wide angle lens, a 17 millimeter lens in spherical becomes a 35 millimeter lens in anamorphic. Same horizontal field of view, but a narrower, I mean, narrow, same horizontal width, but it's a longer lens, it's twice the focal length, which actually really is more like the human experience of vision. These are the things that we think about when we're making a movie. These lens choices are, are paint brushes. You know, why do we, there are reasons why we use spherical lenses for some movies and anamorphic lenses for others. Um, I'm gonna show you a clip from Seabiscuit, which is shot widescreen. It was done on film. Traditionally, I would have said automatically, this is an anamorphic movie. But let me just run it for you and I'll show you the choices I made and why I made them. The, I think a lot of this stuff is probably obvious to you, but it, it, it's what I do. I have to sort of synthesize this stuff into my mind to tell the story. And hopefully, you'll understand the mindset of how us sort of crazy filmmakers think. Okay, so this is a movie I did in 2003 called Seabiscuit. And I knew we were going to shoot in the widescreen aspect ratio because it just fit the shape of the book, right? This movie is about horses and horses composition and fall so nicely into a two floor last year. My original instinct was to shoot this on anamorphic because we were on film. We were going to output the Now back him off, so that back him off. Back him off. So that, that's, a, that's a film in which my instincts were to shoot anamorphic, but as soon as we went out and tested, the experience of being in the audience and seeing the sense of motion, and there's a lot more horse racing in this movie than just this match race, uh, won out. And I knew that to serve the project right, even though I was concerned that I was using a lot less negative area, uh, it was the right it was the right thing to do. And you know, uh, look, I, I love the movie. The advantage I had was 
we, this is right when scanning negative had first come into the industry. So I had the opportunity to take the original negative and scan it as a fairly large file. So when I outputted it, I didn't have to go through the duping process and we were able to sort of have everybody see what was essentially an original camera negative. So I happened to just be in the right place at the right time. Um, I'm also gonna now just show you a clip from another movie, Pearl Harbor, which maybe not, I think it looks great. It's not, it's a bit revisionist. Uh, the attack on Pearl Harbor in the film lasts about 21 minutes longer than the actual attack. So I'm not gonna make you sit through that. But it, again, it was a case of how do you solve problems, right? We had a limited, there's a finite number of vintage World War II aircraft. Um, and that was an opportunity for us. Again, we were day exterior in Hawaii, which is a pretty, it's pretty difficult. It's, you've got 10,000 foot candles in the highlight. I'm, I hope I'm speaking a language that people still, still remember. And you have zero to 10 foot candles in the shadows. So it's a huge amount of dynamic range. Uh, again, digital photography didn't exist back in 1998, or digital cinematography didn't. Uh, but this was an opportunity where I knew we needed the largest negative area we could get. We needed the most real estate, the most silver halide crystals to capture that dynamic range. Uh, and then we chose anamorphic lenses and we pretty much shot on the very long end of the world, telephoto lenses, so that if you really looked at the field of view, it was very narrow so that we could really stack everything that we had into our background, including having sailors run back and forth in and out of frame to make it feel like there were more people there than actually were. I mean, these are all the, the cheats that you do. I mean, the, the cheat here in Seabiscuit is this was shot in the fall. Every shot of the people in the stands cheering the movie on, <coughs> I lit at night to make it look like daytime. So these are the, hopefully you, you never see that. I know it, I suffered through it, but um, you know, those are, in trying to create a seamless story, these, these are the tricks and techniques we use. And obviously, digital cameras have helped, especially with their light sensitivity, because they've allowed us to shoot probably an hour later into the day than, than traditional photochemistry allowed us. So, I mean, by no means are we always looking for the 
the perfect lens. I'm sure that there are many people in this room who build absolutely, flaw I'm sure everybody here builds perfect, absolutely flawless optics. MTFs that are off the chart, line pairs that are just unbelievable. You know, Barbara Streisand may not want to be photographed at that kind of resolution with no chromatic aberration and that much contrast. So we really, we pick our tools to, to really tell the story. And I mean, there are times when you want to use the airy master primes, which are probably the sharpest spherical lenses that we have in our toolbox. And then there's a lot of people now using lenses that were built in Japan in the 60s that I would have never thought of looking at in the era of photochemistry, but now in the era of digital photography, they have all kinds of beautiful flaws and things that people like. Um, you know, it's just, I, I'm really hoping that, because I so enjoy now using digital cameras to capture images, I think they're really beautiful. I just did a series of tests for a new Panavision camera with 8,000 lines of resolution. The beauty of it was that as you get more resolution, the image actually gets softer. It becomes more film-like. It becomes less hard. Um, it's such a beautiful thing, yet I know when this test film gets projected, I have to basically down convert it from 8K to 2K, which is 1 16th its native resolution. So the real, where I'm begging you guys, somebody out there has got to be into this business, please help me help the public get to see a better image. That's really, that's the part of my job that has not caught up with everything else. And unfortunately, I don't know how long the cinema business is a viable business. So I don't see them as wanting to spend millions of dollars to keep upgrading their equipment, you know. But uh, it's, it's the one thing that's holding me back. Now, literally, anybody have any questions? I'm more than happy to, you yell them out, I'll repeat them and, yes, sir. Well, here's the, the answer to your question is, you can fix two sharp images in post. But one of the issues is, and I'm going to be completely frank, I'm one of the highest paid people on a movie, and I'm paid per week. The studios would rather not employ me for a long period of post. Essentially, I'm guaranteed two weeks to do all of the color correction of not only the movie, the Blu-ray DVD, the dreadful airplane pan and scan version, which is still half the time in some square format that I don't know what country, I don't even think you can buy a 133 TV, but we still have to protect for it. Um, H264, and whatever else is coming down the line. So what I'm always trying to do is shoot the image the way I, I want it to be, so that I don't have, because I may not have the time later to fix it. So I think the answer to your question is yes, but I would rather go out there and, and paint the picture that I really want to paint. It's my goal to do the least amount in post-production as possible. Usually most of my post work is dealing with the difference in color temperature as shadows move in and out and the sun moves throughout the day. As we all know, the color temperature of shadows can change. If the sun's out and the sun goes in, the color temperature gets cooler. You know, do the question is, am I changing filters and color temperature settings on the day? Am I changing the gels of the lights? Usually we're moving too fast. In Hawaii, the clouds move way too fast. So you know now that you have a toolbox that you can fix it in post. So that's why if you, I've done, I don't know, 40 motion pictures and I try to usually shoot anamorphic because a 35 millimeter lens in anamorphic gives me a 17 millimeter field of view which to me is more mimics the human experience of how we see the world. So let me, you actually just reminded me of something. So what is the future? The future of what I'm doing, which is really fantastic, is we're going to large format sensors, right? An original uh, digital sensors generally, tw it's 24 millimeters wide. We're now going to 65 millimeter sensors. So 65 millimeter sensors now give us this, the same kind of magnification that anamorphic lenses do. So suddenly in 65 millimeter, you put a 24 millimeter lens on, which technically is a wide angle lens, but these days it's very easy to make it, make it rectilinear uh, and telecentric, so the light comes straight out through the back, and you don't have that kind of very large curved object in the foreground, or images growing three times their image size when they move four feet to or from the camera. 
Uh, and I find that really exciting. I just did a test with this new Panavision camera, and it was just stunning to be able to be in a practical motel room in Palm Springs, very small, but instead of being on a 12 millimeter lens, which obviously has a feeling like it's HAL from 2001, you know, very, very round, suddenly I'm putting up a 24 millimeter lens that has the field of view of a 12, but has the vertical straightness of a, of a, of a really well-made 24 millimeter lens. And I think that's where you're seeing, you'll see as the cost of dealing and, da dealing and wrangling data keeps getting cheaper, you're gonna see that everybody's gonna start to move to a larger format. Right now, the Alexa 65 is one terabyte for nine minutes of recording. Okay, so it's not on, we're now talking about recording a petabyte of data for a movie. When Jim Cameron was doing the visual effects for Titanic in 1997, he spent three and a half million dollars for one terabyte of memory. I can go to Best Buy's and buy that for 40 bucks right now, right? So you guys all know it, it's Moore's Law. Uh, it's more, more is more in a sense. So we're moving to these large formats. The data rates are, in, are obviously insane. I mean, nine minutes for a terror on a one, you know, one terabyte SSD is sort of now the gold standard for, for motion picture photography. And these big sensors are absolutely beautiful because of the medium format lenses. Again, the extra real estate means that they're actually more sensitive to light. And because there are more pixels, they're actually, they resemble film where they have a kind of softness. You know, there's less aliasing, there's less uh, edge sharpening that needs to be done. The question I keep asking them is why do I even need to have an optical low pass filter when we've got this much resolution? No one seems to give me a good answer yet on that, but I think we're heading in that direction where I have to believe, and I, I don't know you, I'm sure plenty of people in here know the answer, but 8,000 lines of resolution is probably as better than, you, than we ever got out of a piece of 35 millimeter film. So we, we have, if we're not at that tipping point, we're beyond it. The only downside is that film allowed us to play it back at its native resolution. Right now, we can't. You know, so that's where, that's where my heart breaks. I mean, that's, that's really the issue for me as a cinematographer is when do you guys get to see the images that I can actually make? And more importantly, when do I get to see them? Because I can't see them. I can see them one-to-one, -one, but then I'm blowing the image up and I'm looking at a little square. I have the beauty that my office changes every day, right? I get to shoot in, everybody says, oh, it's so great, you get to go to Hawaii on Jurassic World. I'm not in the Hawaii that you guys vacation at. I'm as far up a road as you can go till the truck gets stuck and then we carry all the gear in and we pick centipedes off our legs. But I get, my office changes every day. I'm gonna go live in England for a year to do uh, the last of the original nine Star Wars. It's, it's a fantastic career, especially now that my kids are all grown and, and off. But I love the idea of happy accidents. I find it very difficult to work with actors in a green screen environment, and I know actors find it very difficult. There's something that happens when you're in the real world. You see a specular kick off of a leaf that has water on it that in a million years you never would have thought of, but it's what makes that shot so beautiful, right? That's what my job is. You know, what they used to have this joke among cinematographers, what's the difference between a, a flare and a highlight? $2,000 a day, right? So. It's just, it's your aesthetic. And I hope that I will always get, I mean, the, there's nothing more fun than being in a room with Emma Thompson, who's won two Academy Awards, who's absolutely one of the most brilliant people you'll ever meet, and just getting to watch her interact with other actors and, and interact with light. It's, it's why I do what I do. I, I'm gregarious by nature. I like to be outside. I like to work hard. I wouldn't be good stuck in front of a computer. As you can obviously see, I could barely get it to work. Okay, so this picture is shot in Botswana on a Nikon D810, raw, 8,000 lines of resolution, of which we can't see, right? It just, sunset, Okavanga Delta. I wish that I had shot that on Kodachrome 64 so I could really see its true beauty. Now, obviously, the beauty of having it as a digital file is I can show it to you, I could put it on my phone, but I would really love to know what this image really looks like. All I can do is look at it on a 5K monitor, which is what, 
three fifths of the two fifths of the actual image that's there. I'm not so good in math. I used to be, but so that again, this is this is my dilemma. And and thank you guys for listening. Again, I'm a, out here. If you have any questions, I'm more than willing to answer anything that I possibly can. Thanks.